Now, I didn't upload any videos regarding Indian history. From this video onwards, let us have some lessons of Indian history also. And let us look over the overview of Indian history in this video. See, actually, Indian history reveals the past about the India. Its culture, its heritage and its story as well as what are the different angles in studying the Indian history. See, usually people just think that history means just knowing about the stories of India. No. History means analyzing the Indian culture, its heritage and the people who ruled India and different cultures involved during the course of time and how the society changed from those days to these days. Everything comes only under Indian history. Especially for civil services, we are not supported to just read and learn the facts of Indian history. We have to learn the facts. We have to analyze the facts, their consequences as well as why it happened. So, we have to analyze the Indian history in such a broad way with in-depth analysis that gives us a success in civil services. And we are not supported to undermine this subject because even in civil services mains, in general studies, now Indian history along with world history was given importance. So, we have to concentrate on Indian history too. In the past only the optional subject uh, students who just consider Indian history as an optional subject, they only use it to concentrate on Indian history. But now everyone has to concentrate. Anyway, not only for civil services, those who are preparing for banks and for other competitive exams, general awareness is important for them. And in general awareness, Indian history plays a key role. Sometimes questions asked from ancient India about Vedic uh, civilization and about Indus Valley civilization and sometimes they were asked about Delhi Sultanate and also about modern India. So, however, Indian history is not a neglectable subject. It is important. So, let us go through. See, we can divide Indian history into three different categories. They are Ancient India and two, Medieval India three, Modern India Here, this Ancient India is from prehistoric age that is 5 lakh BC to up to nearly 320 BC sorry 320 AD three hundred and twenty AD, the core part of ancient India, but we have to study on this ancient India up to five hundred and fifty AD. Five hundred and fifty AD. Then medieval India. Usually we start the medieval India with Muslim invasion onwards. Around from 1000 AD onwards, almost from 990 AD onwards, the core part of medieval India starts. But from 550 AD to this 1000 AD, this is a transition period between ancient India and medieval India. During this transition period, small kingdoms, very small kingdoms, they started their survival but unable to establish an empire. They are unable to establish an empire. Especially during this transition period, during this transition period from 550 AD to 1000 AD, it was Rajaputs who played a very key role in the history of India. So almost nearly seven to nine different kingdoms who belongs to Rajaputs, they played a key role in 
leading India forward. However, from 1000 AD onwards, the Muslim invasion showed a very drastical impact on the history of India, on the culture of India. So, almost a new culture or a new story has begun for India from this period onwards. So, from 1000 AD to total on up to, we can say, Delhi Sultanate and after the Delhi Sultanate, uh, Mughals, the establishment of Mughals up to 1526 AD and from 1526 AD to late 1600s. So, this belongs to medieval India up to early Mughals. See, 1526 AD was the time when Babur established the Mughal Empire up to Aurangzeb we call the Mughals as early Mughals from the death of the Aurangzeb the latter one that is from Bahadur Shah one onwards we call them as latter Mughals so we consider the period from latter Mughals into the modern India that is Sixteen ninety two, nineteen forty eight. We consider it as modern India. The period of the beginning of the latter Mughals, late sixteen hundred, is the period of beginning of latter Mughals. Bahadur Shah one took the reins. From then onwards, gradually the downfall of Mughal Empire started. So, this is the period the downfall of Mughal Empire started. Fall of Mughal Empire, then European invasion, rise of Europeans. So, from the Portuguese onwards, Portuguese, Dutch, English, French. So, one by one, the Europeans entered India and they showed their influence and a really unimaginable impact on the Indian history in modern times of India. And so, from this period onwards, up to 756 and 57 how the English occupied the Indian provinces and the East India Company took over the political as well as the economical supremacy of India and then from 1756 to 57 up to 1857 in modern India up to 1857 the East India Company ruled through the Chartered Acts. These Chartered Acts gave license to the East India Company to do whatever they want in India. And these charter, Chartered Acts were issued by the British Crown for the benefit of East India Company. Now from this 1857 onwards, a new phase. In 1857, soldiers revolt. The British Indian soldiers they revolted against the East India Company. Almost the situation looked like the India has got freedom. But unfortunately, the Indian soldiers who are in British service, that is British Indian soldiers, they didn't have modern equipment to fight with the British. So, they lost in that battle. Bahadur Shah three was the last Mughal ruler who survived and gave a supportive hand in this soldiers mutiny 1857 soldiers mutiny then after this war the British Crown the, thought that it was the failure and irresponsibility of East India Company in just getting the hold completely on Indian province so from 1858 onwards direct rule of the British British Crown direct rule of the British British Crown so this is the phase totally we call a direct rule of British in India took place from 1858 onwards from 1858 onwards a modern thought and modern thinkers started their 
influence in India and the influence of these modern thinkers, modern educationists also fell gradually on the people of India and one by one, one by one, this modern education brought the feeling of nationalism among the Indians, especially among the youth and a new phase, nationalist movement in India has started from the late 1800s onwards, that is nearly from 1880 onwards. So from 1885 onwards, we divide the nationalist movement of India into different phases. Then after Gandhi entered the situation from 1915 onwards, which we call as Gandhian era. And the nationalist feeling rose to peaks during that period. Under the leadership of Gandhi and with the support of other Congress leaders and the young energetic youth who have sacrificed their life for the freedom of India with the support of all of them in 1947 India has achieved the freedom and on the midnight of 1947 August 15th we got the freedom and Vande Matram was for the first time sung by Sucheta Krupalani it is Sucheta it was Sucheta Krupalani, who for the first time sung Vande Matram at the time of the freedom of India. So, let me give further more explanation about the history of India from here onwards. What actually happened, what we get. I will start from ancient India onwards. Uh, the elaborative classes will be coming soon. But it may take much time. So I already told you the DVDs are ready. You can purchase them by contacting us in the emails which I already provided in the past classes. Of course at the end of this class again I will provide you the email as well as contact number. Now let us go through the history of India. Before going, my advice to you, never try to study Indian history from somewhere in the middle. You get confused because history is a subject which is to be studied linking it with the dates. So dates and facts are also important. Unless otherwise you study it by linking with dates, you cannot get a hold on Indian history. Just taking some pages from the book, thinking it as an important topic and you going through it, that's not going to give you any benefit. It is to be studied in a flow way, that is story by story, story by story, story by story from the beginning through a continuous chronology of dates. Because what happened in the past is going to influence the next. So unless otherwise you have had a grip on the past, you cannot understand why it is happening so now. That's the a main drawback. Usually we fail in getting a hold in history. So start from the beginning. Let it take some time, but start from the beginning. And many of uh, the people they do, they commit a mistake. Thinking that in civil services, especially in prelims, from modern India they give many bits. Of course, sometimes it happened. But if you clearly observe, last three years they thought modern India will be given, uh, from modern India will be given many number of bits. Unfortunately, suddenly from ancient India, uh, the most high number of bits were asked. So, never try to catch the frequency of, frequency of UPSC. It's, it's very hard to expect. Than that, if you just concentrate on studying everything with a limited with a limited material and books instead of studying it in many books if you just keep in front of you a complete reference books and just go through them for number of times you will fetch much so do that so let us go into the class So 
this the journey of ancient India begins with the discovery of civilizations. So we call them as prehistoric civilizations. Proto-historic civilizations. During these prehistoric civilizations, we try to understand how the man appeared on the earth. Finally, we go through the ice ages and the glacial ages and we go through the prehistoric civilizations and what we found in the excavations in this and finally we find that man was appeared during the third interglacial age that is during the third ice age and the fourth ice age during the third ice age and the fourth ice age some very little very little remains of human appearance were formed this prehistoric civilization, the study of prehistoric civilizations begins from 5 lakh BC onwards which we call as a Pleistocenic age. BC which we call as a Pleistocene a Pleistocene period <coughs> from the beginning that is from 5 lakh BC onwards we go by excavations and from the excavations what historians proposed and among them what seemed to be suitable and how they are believed in that way we study the prehistoric civilizations during the analysis of prehistoric civilizations, we have to consider layers and terrains from the layers as well as terrains. Layers and terrains means nothing but when there existed some civilization, some people lived there, maybe due to some natural calamity, a flood comes there. And this flood brings some deposits and uh, leaves those deposits there and go back. But these deposits which remained there will form some layers as well as terrains and when we dig them we will get the samples of what happened in the past so those deposits which uh, just existed there because of flood remains because of flood remains we call them as layers as well as terrains so they have been divided into L1, L2, L3, L4, T1, T2, T3, T4 and the historians basically dig them and from the uh, things that were just obtained from there, they will try to analyze what happened through some scientific approaches like carbon dating. Right, this Pleistocene period and understanding of prehistoric civilizations just goes on up to the Indus Valley Civilization, up to the Indus Valley Civilization and from the Indus Valley Civilization onwards, we just study the proto-historic civilizations. Proto-historic civilizations. And this Pleistocene period, it just up to, we can say, 10,000 BC. That is Old Stone Age. Up to the Old Stone Age, we call it as Pleistocene. From there to the present modern times, we call it as a Holocene. That means Pleistocene means about ancestors, Holocene means about the modern human being. That's it. And after these prehistoric civilizations, we enter into the proto historic civilizations. These proto historic civilizations were found mostly in and around the Son Valley in Pakistan, in present day Pakistan. There is a river called Son, and in the hills and valleys of that. Uh, river we find some caves and we call them as the, the Son culture we call them as Son 
culture. Pre-Son culture and Middle Son Valley culture as well as Proto-Son Valley culture. Finally, we arrive at our first civilization. Indus Valley Civilization. This Indus Valley Civilization actually flourished on the banks of the river Indus. On the banks of the river Indus. <clears throat> Historians say that Egyptian Mesopotamian civilizations were considered as the ancient old civilizations. From there onwards the societies developed in number and due to different types of societies existing at one time there existed a competition among them and to win in the competition and for their survival they just went on moving from one place to one other place and finally causing the Central Asian regions, they enter the Southeast Asian regions and there they found the river Indus. And the plains beside this river Indus were found to be very very fertile. And that fertile tract attracted the people of Indus and they settled on the banks of the river Indus for survival depending on the fertile tract of the Indus plains and thus those people who settled on the banks of the river Indus were the founders of Indus Valley civilization. For survival they need a fertile tract. That fertile tract appeared on the banks of the river Indus and so they settled there. Mehargar of course not a very important place in the Indus Valley Civilization but in the previous period of Indus Valley Civilization Mehargar occupies a very important place and maybe the remains of Mehargar also attracted the Indus Valley Civilization people because if we go through the history of India we find that it is the Mehargar where for the first time cultivation was observed and in Mehargar only community living for the first time in India was also observed and in Mehargar only for the first time pet animals were observed. So just it may be cattle rearing or a wild boar rearing whatever it may be depending upon the animals that was also observed in Mehargar. So uh, just unexpectedly Mehargar played a very crucial role how three important things which drove the history forward community living that is helping one another and living together as a society it is very important for a civilization and that was first time observed in Mehargar you can find it in NCRT books and for survival cultivation is a revolution because how much time they just depend on animals for example they lived in a habitat and all the animals in that habitat were eaten up so again they have to move migrate finding the animals in other habitats so it's tough but now if they find a fertile tract they can live for some years then the time they depend on animals so agriculture so for the first time Cultivation was observed. The remains of cultivation were observed in Mehargar. Then, depending on animals, that is pet animals. So, that is also first time observed only in Mehargar. So, that played a crucial role. Maybe such type of instincts of the people settling in and around that area also might be attracting the Indus Valley people at that time. So they came there and settled there and established a civilization, Indus Valley Civilization, 
we don't call it a rural civilization we call it an urban civilization the reason is they are very modernized they know how to build three story buildings they know how to build a drainage system they know how to bake the bricks and such baked bricks were also used they know how to store the food grains and they know about underground drainage system and they had some citadels citadels means a community bathing places swimming pools just like swimming pools and you know their technology they had very large swimming pools which had also a draining uh, facility when they want some functions they want to just celebrate some functions they used to drain out all the water from those citadels that is swimming pools and just to celebrate their functions there itself after the celebration again they used to fill the water and just use it for community bathing and there was a trade between indus valley people and the people between the mediterranean regions in and around the mediterranean sea so if they are able to do trade means so they had some better transport system and lodhal at the tip of gujarat lodhal was the port town of the indus valley people port town of indus valley people they also had inland transportation system such a developed civilization was theirs so it is not a rural civilization it is an urban civilization but this indus valley civilization which was said to this indus valley civilization which was said to flourish from 3000 bc it reached its peak by 2500 bc and gradually by 1500 to 1200 bc it totally disappeared some historians say it may be due to some natural calamities but the most accepted theory was from central asian steppes some new people called aryans they were also in search of a new area for their survival and they also found the tracks of indus and then the tracks of indus when they gone through the uh, river indus after entering entering into india they found the plains of brahmaputra ganga <coughs> ganga brahmaputra and narmada the plains surrounded by these three rivers were found very very fertile for them so on the banks of the river sindhu that is from indus to almost <coughs> up to the plains of ganga yamuna brahmaputra and narmada we call it as a sapta sindhu region at that place the aryans came and in a fight they defeated the indus valley people and after defeating them these aryans called the indus people as dasyas as dasyas and thus using the indus people as servants aryans established their own civilization after this 1500 and during the period of 1500 bc a new civilization aryan civilization based on vedas so also called as vedic civilization flourished in india so indus valley civilization was first and the second is aryan civilization or vedic civilization 
so this was the second civilization in the history of India.